haven't heard of the year of the soil before. There may have been one, but this is a new for me. I hope that after the liturgy we've shared so far, you're not asking why on earth the soil found its way into a Sunday service. Let me quote from the resources that we're using today. This powerful source of life is so often taken for granted, covered with concrete and mismanaged. Studies report that approximately 33% of our soils are facing moderate to severe degradation in forms such as soil erosion, nutrient depletion, loss of soil diversity, soil pollution, loss of organic matter, and more. So this will threaten the capacity of the earth to sustain the needs of future generations. But there is hope. We can work to redress the balance of carbon in the atmosphere, practice sustainable soil management, shrink our carbon footprint, preserve and increase vegetable cover, and spread the word about the importance of soils. Many churches are already hard at work managing community gardens, particularly in urban areas where green space is hard to come by, and relearning the art of growing vegetables and creating compost, the garden's goal. Another important way people are contributing to the restoration of biodiversity is through seed saving and planting a diversity of crops and plants. There is much we can do to reduce our dangerous greenhouse emissions. Natural opportunities for carbon capture include peat production, reforestation and wetland restoration. For the sake of the earth, and a sustainable future, we do need to talk about soils. Now I know there are people in our congregation who are well aware of all this and who practice sustainable living as a natural part of their faith-filled lives. The thing is, there's been a mistaken idea attributed to Christianity and spread through all the Western world that nature has no reason for existence safe to serve humanity. It came from a particular interpretation of Genesis. In recent years, we've been rethinking what the story means and how we see our role. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Then later, after, afterwards, when they're, when they're driven out from Eden in the story, he is given the soil to till, which is what he was given in the first place. And we note the connections between the words human, humility, and humus, the earth, and the name Adam that comes from Adama, in other words, an earth creature from the earth. In recent years, we've seen the emergence of eco-theology, which is reshaping our understanding of God in creation. We now understand how we are bound in interconnected relationships with the earth, rather than a dominant and submissive one. These new, but in reality ancient, understandings can have quite a quirky side did you know, for instance, that a teaspoon of good soil has more microbes in it than people there are than there are people on earth? Kath James writes, have you ever wondered what the world would be like without ants? Consider this, if all humanity disappeared off the face of the earth, the rest of life, except for domestic animals and plants, which are a tiny fraction of whole. The rest of the world would benefit enormously. The forests would grow back and relative stability would return to the ecosystems which control atmosphere and temperature. But of course
course, there'd be no humans around to enjoy it. But if ants disappeared, the results would be catastrophic. Ants turn and aerate large parts of the Earth's soils. They are major predators of other insects and they are chief scavengers of small animals, removing and breaking up more than 90% of any small dead creatures as part of the soil nutrient cycle. And they even pollinate many plants. The theme of World Environment Day this year is 7, million, no, 7 billion dreams, one planet, consumed with care. It carries the idea of sustainable production and consumption and an acknowledgement that the ecological problems the world is facing are tied up with the human drive for more, more money, more time, more stuff, more everything, quicker, faster, better, more interactive, more resources, produced more cheaply, with no thinking about the waste. And this, to me, is a moral and spiritual issue. A few years ago, the United Church made a statement called An Economy of Life, and I've run off a few copies, and they're out on the table there if you're interested. It reminds us that we already have enough. God already provides for us in abundance. What needs to change is how what we have is used and distributed. An alternative vision for a world of peace with the earth has at its core both abundance and limitation. It's abundant because we become free to take up our role of admiring creation and being involved as creative, active citizens. Because the well-being of people and the planet is prioritised over the accumulation of personal wealth. Jesus embraced the image of a great international banquet of peace among all peoples and with God. It's a powerful expression of this good news. And it gave special meaning to the shared meals in his ministry. And it became the basis for this shared meal of the Eucharist among his followers and which celebrates his hope <coughs> and his broken and poured out life. In this vision, these things are possible because we recognise there are limits. Encouraged by their citizens, governments would set limits to how much coal we mine, how much we consume, how much we advertise, how much profit is made, how much tax is able to be dodged, how much power is held in the hands of a few. We would set limits on how much we consume and work. We would not assume never-ending economic growth, but we would assume that there are limits to how much human activity and interference the Earth can sustain. So how does this vision change the way we see ourselves in relation to the Earth? How does it change the way we view the soil beneath our feet? Partly this is an individual question, as much as it is a collective one. What are the values we live by? And where do we draw the line for ourselves in terms of how we live? But also important is the question of how we talk to each other and share a vision for the peace of the earth. One of the best things, I think, that have come from the Painting the Stars series that both of our small groups have engaged in, there's about 18 people in our congregation have completed this study now, it's the reminder of how we fit at the interface between what's out there and what's down inside. You know that we are understanding more and more the hugeness of creation, the distances from the stars, and also the microbes, that the world within is as big, and the smaller world is just as big as what's out there, and we're at kind of an interface. I think the awe and wonder that's evoked when we understand our place in the great 
scheme It's what will inspire us to live in a way that is truly sustainable. And when we remember that God is incarnate in all creation, just as the spark of God is within us, then we will live naturally and peacefully with the rest of creation. So let's sing now, Touch the Earth Lightly. We have done it before, but not very often. It's got a tricky change of key in the first verse. 